Well, good afternoon, everyone, or evening. First error of the day there already. I've taken myself off mute. Welcome, everyone, to the first Farmers Weekly Transition Summit. My name is Andrew Meredith. I'm the Farmers Weekly Editor, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. In this five-part Transition Summit series, we'll be taking a closer look at all the issues related to preparing to adapt your farm business to survive and thrive as farm subsidies change and new environmental schemes are introduced throughout the UK in all the different devolved regions. This is just one part of our transition project, which also includes coverage in print on our website and in a special podcast series with our transition farmers. In each strand of this project, we aim to bring together farmers from around the country and representatives from all parts of the agricultural industry to help everyone prepare for some of the biggest challenges this industry has faced in decades. Over the next two hours this evening, we are going to begin at the beginning and ask what are the steps farmers should be taking now to be able to prepare in the year for the years to come. The format of this evening will be as follows. In this moment, we'll watch two videos, one from Farmers Weekly that explains in a bit more detail the challenges ahead, and then from our first transition partner, the AHDB, who will talk about how they are helping farmers to prepare. Then we'll dive straight into our first panel discussion with DEFRA and farm advisors to talk about the road ahead. Around about 6 p.m., we'll welcome our second panel of farmers and representatives from the dairy and cereal sectors to talk in more detail about benchmarking, the vital tool that helps many farmers accurately assess how healthy their business is and where their weak points are. So without further ado, let's roll straight into those videos. Welcome to this very first Farmers Weekly Transition Summit. UK agriculture faces some big changes over the coming years, including the withdrawal of the basic payment scheme. On average, the basic payment makes up a third of farm incomes, yet one in three farmers have done nothing to prepare for its withdrawal. And the withdrawal of the payment will have a massive effect on farms such as those run by beef and sheep producer James McCartney. I mean, I'm concerned seriously for the industry as a whole. Uh, I've already mentioned that I think our business is semi-prepared for it. We don't have a huge basic payment because um, a lot of our ground is tenanted. But there's a lot of farmers like me that rely on it for their income. Um, and it's a real concern for those smaller family farms like my own, how they're going to survive once Elms replaces the basic payment scheme. Because the information that we've received at the moment suggests that the, the financial reward is going to be far lower than what we're currently receiving. Mr McCartney says he wants to be sustainable, both financially and environmentally. Probably most importantly to us, the financial sustainability of the business. Um, but then I guess linked with that is environmental sustainability. But they both kind of tie in together. It's no good being one without the other. So us being carbon neutral doesn't work if we're not making any money. I mean, we're going to have to do two things. We're going to have to probably look at areas that we can intensify where and put some less productive land into these into the environmental schemes. But we're also going to have to look at further diversification projects. Uh, I mean, I'm lucky that we've got lots of ideas, so we will be diversifying further as well. Fundamentally, the, the core farming enterprises do have to stand on their own two feet, um, and we've got to find a way of doing that. So how can farm businesses ensure that they're best placed to survive and indeed thrive without the basic payment? That's the question that this Farmers Weekly Transition Summit seeks to answer. Hello, I'm Derek Carlos. I head up AHDB's Farm Economics team. Our work is focused on providing tools and support to farmers to help them to assess how their farm is performing and to make changes and drive improvements in profitability. We have team members around the country working with farmers on a daily basis, helping them to understand their farm's strengths and weaknesses through using their data and benchmarking. This work is increasingly important given the upcoming changes in agricultural policy across England. 
Industry is entering a transition period of reducing direct support, which begins this December with the first cuts to BPS payments. This will continue for the next six years until the final small BPS payment is made in 2027. This is giving cause for concern to many farmers across industry, as highlighted earlier in the case study. This backdrop and the importance of raising awareness not only of the challenges ahead, but of the opportunities, tools, resources and support available from AHDB is the reason why we're very pleased to be supporting the Farmers Weekly and this transition campaign today. AHDB have secured significant funds from DEFRA to help us to make our tools and support available to more farmers across the country than ever before. Under the Future Farm Resilience Fund, we have DEFRA funding su to support 4,000 farmers across England to help them understand how their farms will be affected by the loss of BPS income and to discuss with them what steps can be taken now and over the next two or three years before the cuts really start to take effect. AHDB's Farm Business Review Tool forms the basis of our offer and half day one-on-one -on -one consultancy from our trusted partners will support you through the process, understanding what the changes will mean and what can be done, building on the strengths and weaknesses identified in the data. In addition to the BPS impact calculator, there's a simple resilience checklist and the ability to see how well your farm is performing by entering data and calculating some very simple key performance indicators. Beyond this, there are a number of opportunities for more detailed insight and support in one of three areas. You can look at more detail in your cost of production and enterprise profitability by using our farm bench tool. You could choose to undertake a full farm carbon assessment. And there's a possibility that you could choose an agribusiness appraisal, which will review all aspects of your business, including budgeting, profitability, borrowings, and take a look at strategic business planning matters, such as succession planning or tenancy issues all with a focus on long-term farm business viability. So any beef, sheep, dairy or arable farmers in England should take some time to work out what these BPS changes mean for their farms. If you're happy with what you've done and how your farm looks without BPS, then that's great. However, if you've not done this work or you're unhappy with the impact for your farm, then we can help. To understand more, please go to the resources hub on the right hand side of your screen and follow the links to sign up to this free service. The upcoming panel discussion will continue on this subject and includes a DEFRA representative who will be able to say more about the Resilience Fund and what it aims to achieve. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. Thanks to Derek Carlos and everyone at AHDB for that second video, which touches on a number of important points, which we'll get to right in a way. Let me introduce the panel who's going to be discussing them this evening. Our four guests are Caroline Drummond, the Chief Executive of LEAF, which for those of you who don't know is linking environment and farming, and she's a sustainability expert. We're also joined by Gary Markham, a farm consultant from Land Family Business, who specialises in joint ventures and other methods of farm-to-farm -farm collaboration. We've got Rob Hitch, an accountant with Dodd & Co, who works particularly in the dairy sector. And finally, as that video mentioned, we have Jonathan Baker, a senior civil servant from DEFA with responsibility for a big chunk of future farm policy in England. Thank you all very much for being with us this evening. And before we get started, can I just remind you to keep your questions coming in in the question box and we'll get through as many of them this evening, put those to our panel as possible. But Jonathan, let me come straight away to you first. I see you're on mute, but if you're unable to unmute yourself, let's pick straight up on the Farm Resilience Fund right there. What is it and who is it for? Hi everybody. Uh, hi, yes, so Jonathan Baker from DEFRA. Uh, pleasure to be here and a really important conversation and important that um, DEFRA and 
colleagues are involved in these sorts of conversations. So fantastic to see this happening. Um, so the Future Farming Resilience Fund. So that is a fund with the sort of second phase of that fund. So this is an opportunity for um, uh, for farmers to work with uh people across the country nationally or with their local regions to work to um, consider what these changes mean for them as uh, farm businesses. So specifically, we're offering uh, free advice and support for farmers to understand the changes which are happening, identify how, what and when they might want to adapt their business need. And there's then um, accessing tailor support uh, to help farmers adapt. And that's being provided by a whole range of different organisations. There's 19 um, at the moment, so a range of, kind of land agents, kind of local agricultural co-ops uh, county council as well as some of the more national bodies so and one of the big lessons we've learned already from the initial phase is that uh, farmers want to work with people they trust and uh, people that they work with regularly rather than directly to defra so it's, that's why we're working through these third party third party bodies so if you haven't heard um about that before it's worth having a look so future farming resilience fund you'll come straight to our blog and then you can see the 19 organizations you can you can contact them directly find the one that works for your sector the one that works in your area and just say you know what's up and, and how can i how can they help and they'll come back to you uh, and um, provide support as appropriate and just tell us some of the key questions you hope those experts will be helping farmers mm. to answer so some of the things that we know uh, for, for some time is that um, obviously the big areas for farmers to respond is around kind of increasing income, reducing costs and reducing waste. Um, so we we recognise that for some farmers there's a need to have some additional support around that and there are some barriers for farmers going out to the market and, and getting that and paying for that themselves. So we're trying to fix that, recognising that as we take away the basic payment scheme, we want to give as many farmers as possible a chance, remove as many barriers as possible to farmers having a chance to respond to these changes. Um, so those, um, each of those uh, people who are providing the resilience fund will be working with individual farmers, finding out works, what works for them, responding to what the individuals, what questions and challenges that they've got. Uh, but we're learning some kind of really important stuff already around the role of long-term support. So when people come pr provide that support, it's not a one-off discussion. It's something which carries on for a while. Um, as much as possible, face-to-face, -face, farmers respond much better. We've seen the face-to-face advice, which has been a bit of a challenge. Um, yeah, so it's really for those individuals and those trusted experts, people who really know how to make um, agricultural businesses tick, talking to farmers, working out where they are, what questions they've got, how they, where they are in terms of responding to these changes, and then building a plan that works for them. This money is so important because there are some big changes coming down the line. We saw on that graph in that second video, of course, you know, the drop off in BPS payments, the pace at which they'll be happening, they'll be gone by 2028. Yeah. The, the, you know, for some farmers in particular, this is a really, really big part of their income. And and what we're hearing, uh, you know, in our transition survey, which we ran at the end of July, is many farmers feel like they just don't know enough yet to be able to prepare. Do you think that's a fair criticism? That, you know, has DEFRA released enough information yet? And, and when will farmers, you know, learn more uh, about what's going to happen next year and in the years ahead? Yeah. But it's a great, I think it is a completely, it's both a completely fair um, point, uh, but one that we're doing from our perspective for, for really fair reasons. So in terms of the information that we have released, I think there's always a real tendency, a bit like, you know, if you're missing a missing a tooth, your, your tongue really focuses on the gap rather than the ones you've got left, not that I've lost a tooth recently, but um, my six-year-old has. But um, so we've set out some really key information around what the profile direct payments look like over the entirety of the transition. That I suggest and when I worked as a CLS as an advisor, that is about 80% of the information I think realistically for farmers to be acting on and responding to. That is a pretty strong signal that's been set out and that's been legislated for in the Agriculture Act. So that I think that tells a big part of the story, which it's easy for us to to walk past. We've also set out when the schemes are going to be starting. And we've, I think with SFI, so the Sustainable Farming Incentive, we're currently running a pilot. We That will start to roll out next year from 2022. We've said what that's going to look like in that very first year and what the payment rates will be will look like. So you can start to get a sense from looking at those payment rates and from the design of those standards, what future schemes will look like. And we've also set out um, some planning assumptions around how much money we expect to allocate across the three different environmental land management offers. So 
I think there's quite a strong signal. Uh, and then finally, um, we talk about the kind of productivity grants and support, which is out there to help farms adapt and respond to their businesses. So I think it's really fair and reasonable. And perhaps there isn't the detailed information that farmers are thinking about, about you know, whether or not they move into uh, different farming systems exactly. But there's a lot of information out there, um, which uh, I think farms can be acting on and kind of picking up. And the thing which worries me uh, a little bit from the conversation from the video was that a third of farmers aren't responding. Uh, and we kicked off, we did a, we're doing a, a survey every year to see what the results are, uh, up to, to see how farmers are responding to these changes. And we started to see a slight increase in farmers acting and responding. We've seen a slight increase in farmers saying that they have the information that they need. Uh, so we're seeing an improving picture. Um, but I think the thing that worries me a little bit would be good to pick up for this panel is why more farmers perhaps aren't feeling like they can or should be acting. And that's partly what the resilience offer is about, like really crystallising that conversation with farmers. Well, let's jump straight in there, Gary. You MC, you're keen to uh, uh, share your thoughts on that. Go ahead. Why, why aren't farmers acting? You're on mute, Gary. OK, yeah, thanks, Andrew. So, um, I think I just wanted to make the point that I've been I've been um, benchmarking uh, uh, my clients for a, a number of years uh, in the arable sector, and uh, this is an, an, a different element of it actually. Jonathan is that is that there's, I find there's a strong correlation between um, family communication and and our bottom twenty five percent group. So, so basically, what we've got two elements to this. I think we've got the productivity and the technical, which we're all approaching and, and dealing with, hopefully fairly effectively. But there's the family side as well, um, and I, and I think that um, individuals in a family that that relate to each other um, and have strong interpersonal um, and family values are actually um, more productive. So I, I think there's another side to all of this. We can actually focus very much on pro productive and technical, but really we must be supporting and, and helping some of these families, which are, and I've got several clients who are struggling because of the uh, of, of the pressure uh, and suffering from depression, etc. So I think there's 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 a family side as well that needs um, input into uh, helping them make the change. So if I might just, uh, just to, please. Oh, sorry, just to, just to come back on that, because I think because I'd like to hear the views of the rest of the group. But so actually, the resilience fund um, uh, and minister, minister Prentice in particular, ministers were really keen included this because they hear it so strongly from farmers. Is around succession planning. It's explicitly yeah. something which we're looking through. And I think civil servants, we had a slight squeamishness, even though those who work in the farming sector understand how important it is. We had a slight squeamishness to get involved in that. But the minister from the the message from ministers that we're getting from farmers is exactly the same as you're, you've just described is that that's a really important part of it and it's quite and that's one of the values of having these resilience stuff done by the resilience fund run by other parties is that they have that understanding many of them work in those communities and farmers can therefore can have those sorts of conversations and just as a final point is the mental health and well-being aspect is something we're making sure we're tracking that people who are running the fund are thinking about that and uh, have have ways of kind of responding and acting if they do see people in you know, kind of a uh, you know co kind of genuine distress they, they, they know how to respond when they see that sorry andrew Thanks. Uh, let's bring in Caroline there. Caroline, you know, our research, just to carry on that thread, because it is such an important one, our, our transition research, sound like Sean Connery, our transition research showed that a third of farmers have still not begun preparing for BPS withdrawal. But, you know, what, what do you think are those barriers to preparing and, and what are you telling farmers about why it's important to sort of do it sooner rather than later, should we say? I mean, I, th I think, thank you, uh, uh, partly, you know, as has been alluded, it's it's certainty. Every single day farmers deal with risk and the critical element of that is making sure that they make the right decision as much as possible. Um, and I think one of the big challenges, there's, you know, there's the, the background of, of the sort of skills, capability, access to information, research and parts, you know, whether it be tractor parts or, you know, parts of the parlour or whatever, right through to the challenges around our changing policy and, of course, climate change, particularly with the impact of unforeseen weather events. So farmers are having to make their own decisions every single day. And I think, you know, uh, we've been benchmarking since 1993, uh, particularly around 
farm practices. And, um, you know, farmers are always looking to continuous in, continuously improve. And the real strength behind all of this is making sure you're doing the right thing for the right business. And if you're looking for government to, in effect, be the driver for the reason why you farm, you've almost kind of got the wrong lever there in terms of making the right decision. So I think first and foremost, um, there are a lot of farmers certainly preparing their businesses. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I make no pretense about the fact that the farmers that we work with at LEAF are can-do farmers. They are vibrant. They are very much looking at trying to drive change, but they also are inspirational to very many other farmers. And that peer-to-peer -peer piece of, of raising the game for everybody is going to be very key. And I think what's going to be so important is the funds, um, you know, that Jonathan is obviously talking about, um, supplement the capability of the individuals on their farm. And I think that's, you know, that's what the tests and trials have been about. That's the sort of the drive and the ambition from a government perspective. Um, but um, whilst we see sort of the BPS reducing it, that money, you know, it was, was still promised a pot that is the same. So that money should be supporting the capability of farmers to actually address the climate change challenges, the building in that I need to put in a succession plan within my business, or I need to invest in new kit. And what does that look like? Um, and in addition to that, further infrastructure. So not only can we actually build internally here in the UK, the ambition for creating British food and sustainability in British food, but also our export markets as well. Let's, let's pick up there on that point about how the pot is staying the same size in total, at least until the end of this parliament. That's the pledge from government. Rob, dairy farmers in particular, are they going to struggle if we've got some dairy farmers on the call here, if they finish milking? Do you think they're going to struggle to tap into those environmental payments? You know, a lot of dairy farmers are quite intensive businesses. Maybe there's not a lot of, you know, these rougher areas on their farm which they can perhaps put into a scheme. Are you, are you particularly worried about that sector? I think, um, you know, that the basic payment probably isn't worth as much to dairy farms as it, is to, as it is to some other sectors and obviously when we're talking about agriculture as a whole we need to be careful that different sectors are affected in different ways and to a larger and, and lesser extent but it will still be you know basic payments worth about 1.3 1.4 penny on a pence a litre on most farms probably on the more extensive ones over two um and when that goes it will put a, a big dent in the bottom line in that it'll it'll you know, half profitability or, half, you know, certainly half surplus. Um, and whether they can replace that with government schemes is probably debatable. You know, I was just looking at the um, Sustainable Farming Initiative guy, um, instructions for the, you know, the grassland areas. And there's a, and you can understand what the drive is to try and reduce pollution, but there's a drive to get um you know limit to get 60 pound a hectare you've got to limit slurry spreading to get 100 pound a hectare you've got to limit your nitrogen use 100 pound a hectare is probably worth one ton of dry matter to most dairy farmers which they can grow by putting the fertilizer on so you know in reality they probably find that the the, the payment rates aren't enough to actually stop them being productive farmers um, and the government maybe want that, you know, they've made it probably clear, I think, that we maybe end up with a two stream approach where we've got productive capacity on some ground and we've got more park keeping on other on other areas. You know, and living in Cumbria with the Lake District slap bang and the Pennines around us, you know, you can you can understand a bit of logic for that, but it doesn't make it easy to have a one size fits all policy. You know, we. We act for clients at both extremes, I suppose. We've got small hill farms with a, with sheep and a few suckler cows, and we've got some big, large dairy farms. So. Well, let's put that point straight back to, to Jonathan then. Jonathan, is there an expectation within DEFRA that mm. perhaps if there's a hill farmer on the call this evening, pretty high up the hill, 
pretty extensive that he's going to be pretty find it he or she will let me find it pretty easy to collect a bigger wedge of this payment going forward whereas somebody in the lowlands not so much and so we can that money is therefore going to be targeted at those more environmentally um i don't, I don't want to see use the word precious areas because you know every part of the country has its own niches and importance but is the money going to end up up the hill rather than down i suppose the short version of that question yeah so i think the way that i think the short answer is um the short answer is, is no. And the reason why that is if we look to so the sustainable farming incentive, the scheme that we provide the most information about uh, and the pilot, you know, kind of um, about to roll out uh, and 22 starting, we set out what we're doing for next year. So that's an offer we want available to every farmer, kind of universal offer. So the way the sustainable farming incentive is if we can write it down and you don't need a lot, a lot of advice to do it, if it's basically the same activity everywhere um, and uh, if we want farmers to do it at real scale, then it goes in SFI and there's loads and loads of fantastic things that can go in SF sustainable farming incentives. So that's a, a kind of want that to be a near universal offer or, we, or rather I want my job to get really hard because so many people are doing it because it's such an effective scheme and it pays really well for them that uh, it becomes, you know, some people do it become problematic for us to, to fund. Um, so that is a scheme that we would want almost, we've talked about 70% of farmers being involved in one or more of our schemes. So you know, the dream would be we get a really high percentage of farmers involved in those schemes. And that is not about that's not about radically changing. That's not about moving away from agriculture necessarily. It's about making the best use of your land. It's about kind of uh, changing inputs, about kind of thinking about um, extensifying those bits of the farm which are less productive, taking out field corners, uh, improving head drain management. So really working around the agricultural systems. Um, so that that's a big part of it. And that, that things will look different, things will feel different for farmers, but that is not... That's certainly not about taking money up the hill. That's something which should, which has to work for every farm in the country. And if you look at the scale of the challenges we've got around, obviously, the agricultural system itself, but net zero, we've just signed up to more wildlife restoration targets by 2030. You know, we really need every every scrap of land to be pulling its weight from an environmental perspective, and SFI will help us do that. So the other two schemes, so particularly local nature recovery, will be more will be more targeted. But again, we wouldn't. That's not to say that we would exclude even you know really intensive high performing dairy farmers but rather we want to design the scheme financially and like logistically and administratively which farmers can look at it and go all farms can go okay this work this is the best thing to do for my farm so if an extensive or so intensive dairy farmer you might go well, there's a small field it's just not worth the faff i'll just i'll do a b or c of that you know i'll, I'll maybe put it into, into trees or i'll kind of you know i'll stop putting inputs on it and i'll get the income and that actually works for me that's the best return Whereas for some farmers might go, actually, this is going to work for 80% of my business and I'll the rest of it I'll contract out and so on and so forth. So we the way that we're conceptualizing it is, is making offers that work for farmers, they can then do what works for them. And that's a bit different for other parts of the country. So particularly, I think Wales are looking to be a bit more strategic, a bit more targeted about what can be done. Whereas ours is more of a market-led, we're going to build an offer. And as um, I was just said, if it doesn't work for farmers, it doesn't profitably work, then they'll, they'll vote with their feet. Uh, the challenge for, for, for me and the challenge for the government is then to make sure our offers are A, attractive enough and B, we're paying enough attention so we can see when that's happening and respond accordingly. So one of the concerns we've got at the moment, prices are really good. You know, will people engage a sustainable farming incentive? Will people continue to engage in countryside stewardship? But those are the sorts of problems that we, you know, we just have to be, it's just reasonable to have when you're working with a, an economic sector and you're trying to get them to do positive things um, for which we're the primary market. Come in there, Gary. Yeah, so I, I'm just quite quite interested in that. Um, uh, in, in, in all of those schemes, uh, 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 obviously, are, are very good. So I, I believe that um, move, helping farmers and families moving forward, collaboration is quite important, which which helps um, some of the depression we have in the industry. It will help uh, all the, not the knowledge sharing, which is hopefully upping the game. And I'm just wondering why we haven't got as part of the SFI, or we may have it in Elms, I don't know, or will there be in Elms, any funding to assist in collaboration. We've had in the past many years ago through EFFP, I think it was, um, which is partly government funded, there was funds there which I tapped into and and um, sort of structured up quite a few joint ventures, and some of them are going since about 20 years and still going really, really well. 
and and it's just really interesting to see the knowledge sharing in all of that which is what we're what we're doing but that knowledge sharing happens automatically then uh, but by doing that because people are collaborating so if, if there was some assistance to help people collaborate i think we might be able to progress um, individual farms would still be th th their own farms but they'd be collaborating as joint ventures yeah no i so it's a message to come through really strongly and when we talked to hdb did a great report about the sort of top aspects of um successful farms uh, and some of our own evidence shows that when we talk to farmers who are more confident about the changes that that collaboration joint ventures is one that that steps out quite strongly so i mean it, english farming has always been less collaborative or is said to be less collaborative than we see certainly across the across europe and that's something which even farmers themselves feel you talk to farmers as you all know you, you know get that strong sense of um you know kind of machinery rings and so on and so forth just haven't really kicked off and actually when we're looking at stuff like producer organizations um which were a big part of the common agriculture policy massive across lots of europe i think we've got one around peas and perhaps a few others apologies if i miss any but you know it's much that collaboration is something which we traditionally um, do much less well so yeah definitely a problem that we can solve i think it's a cultural challenge uh, and we can do our job to, to move the fall to, to help a little bit so one of the things we have done is we had the facilitation fund about bringing people to farmers together around countryside stewardship agreements helping farmers um, uh, develop a design agreements which um complement each other so that people and that they would deliver their agreements where it would complement each other so they perhaps would uh time their the kind of different parts of their management of their business so that it, as a landscape it was really positive so you weren't all kind of stripping away all the habitat of one particular thing at a time around like buffers or something similar um so definitely that's the thing that we're offering the countryside stewardship facilitation fund have a look um i think there's still potential for people to get involved um uh yeah so and then within how what we do within the new elm offers so it's sustainable farming incentive is supposed to be a kind of bit more um, kind of targeted a bit le a bit more kind of farm level 100 percent local nature recovery and landscape recovery the next two offers will only work through effective collaboration um so that's a, a definite a definite big thing uh, and we can see the challenge for us though really is that it's a bit like you know bar of soap you squeeze it too hard it disappears so the the farm clusters G grain gwct game one our conservation trust like an amazing initiative um really effective the best way that we could kill that is by is by making requiring people to join a farm cluster or something similar. So we, you know, we've got quite, um, we, you know, we've got quite a tight grip. Uh, uh, so we're trying to let those things kind of come up. And I think the, the cluster farms are a really good example. We see those farm people on those farms really benefiting from countryside stewardship in particular. But I mean, you know, Caroline, you know, Leaf is a big. I don't know to what extent collab collaboration is a part of the Leaf value, but um, be good to see what ha the rest of the industry and, and the supply chain are doing. Go ahead, Caroline. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think, uh, yes, we often get, oh, we're not very good at collaborating. I mean, we see it in spades and buckets and loads of collaboration. It happens in different ways. Uh, obviously, France, they've had huge tax incentives uh, that have helped support many of those, in effect, forced cooperatives and collaboration. But actually, you know, whether it, you know, married to a dairy farmer, whether it be buying groups, whether it be veterinary groups where you're benchmarking, et cetera, those collaborations have worked really well. Where we, where it works incredibly well with our demonstration farms, it's, you're kind of, it's not necessarily contiguous collaboration, it's mental collaboration, it's mind collaboration, and where you have a common approach or a common ambition for supporting sustainable agriculture. So we're seeing, you know, a huge amount of that. And I think that's been a really important part for us of actually the tests and trials that we've been doing in terms of just because you don't live next to somebody who's, you know, really driving their business, actually, why can't you get access from information elsewhere? And so those collaborations are important. We've seen some fantastic collaborations, particularly through Open Farm Sunday, um, where actually it's kind of completely unrelated to your business, but actually the real common aim is to drive trust and understanding amongst the public. So, you know, with hundreds of farms, um, hopefully next year we, we had 100, over 100 this year open up, but, you know, hundreds of farms opening up again through that collaboration area. And I think, as you say, Jonathan, the importance of whether it be landscape or whether it be cluster across um catchments is increasingly important 
And the, the key for that is a good facilitator and a shared objective. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the work from GWCT, a lot of the work that we've been doing with them in that particular area to really drive ambition. And it all becomes a little bit competitive, you know, particularly when it comes to environmental um, sort of targets and outcomes as well. Okay, let's move the discussion on a little bit. We've done quite a bit on collaboration there, and that's really useful. But Rob, let's bring you back in. You know, the point of this first discussion to an extent was taking stock of how ready your business is for the changes that are to come. When a farmer, you know, comes to see you, maybe it's that end of year discussion, financial end of year, and they're taking a look at the business health and they say, next year, I'd like to do a little bit more to just keep an eye on how things are. I'm not really sure if my business can manage without the subsidy payment in three or four years time. You know, what is that information that you're really honing in on with them? And perhaps share a little bit about, you know, what are the red lights that you're seeing in, in some businesses that they need to take action on? I think, I mean, following all the discussion about, you know, cooperation, it, it is definitely an answer for some people. But the important thing at the moment is we do know what the direction of travel is. You know, DEFRA have been very clear. Nobody is going to reinvent the wheel. Subs the subsidy in its current form is being removed over the next seven years, as was so gracefully illustrated earlier by AHDB. And I think most people, you know, people that understand where the business sits and where they're at are looking at things to do. But there are a lot of people that perhaps think it's too difficult. But actually, it's, for, you know, it's, it's not complicated to work out the implications for some of these changes on your business. You know, it, even taking your latest accounts and just, you know, looking at the bottom line and then knocking the subsidy off is a, is a starting point and is in effect a budget for what life will be like in eight years time presuming all everything else remains the same. You know, we, we also have a whole host of other things that are impacting on farming at the moment, which might drive other changes that people need to be aware of. So I think, you know, we're, we're looking and encouraging people to, you know, estimate what the impact on their business, the removal of the basic payment will be. Will they be able to access funds from um, ELMS in any way? Will the you know will the the boxes they have to be ticked to to tick be too difficult to achieve or not worth achieving? I think that'll be the, the question certainly for some of the intensive livestock units, um, but for others it will be and there'll be better you know availability. But I think we also need to be mindful of the other pressures that are on agriculture. You know we've got um, well labour isn't just a problem for agriculture you know it's a problem for every sector of the industry of, of, of industry in the uk at the moment you know there's a, a million job vacancies apparently you know that we got told earlier this week so you know there's pressure on labor which will affect we know it's affecting fruit and veg growers we know it's affecting dairy farms we know it's affecting slaughterhouses and you know at what point does that become a put pressure on red meat slaughter and and values you know so we, we need to be we, we need to think about basic payment going what it can be replaced with and i think people should be doing very simple budgets you know if i set out my accounts for how they'll look in five years time if i take the basic payment out assuming nothing changes where am i if if it still ticks a box then that's not so bad um but if people need to change things now is the time to be doing it and if, if someone's done that simple calculation, bottom line, take the subsidy off, it's a big red number, they're pretty worried about it. You know, one option, as we touched on when I rudely interrupted you eating your cheese at Westmoreland Show last week, is retirement. You know, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that for some farmers, there comes a moment where it might be the right thing to do. It's certainly one option. Now, you know, we haven't mentioned one scheme this evening so far that is also coming up next year, and that's the lump sum exit scheme. Uh, do you know if any of you know your clients are taking a look at that, or if they're, or if interest in maybe leaving farming has increased a little bit because of these changes coming in general? 
I think there is some interest in the lump sum scheme, but we have to bear in mind it's capped at a hundred thousand pounds. And if you if you want to go some, you know, if you're a tenant farmer in the Lake District and you want to buy a house locally, that doesn't go very far. And if you're in the home counties, it probably goes less far. Um, but it will be an attraction, and it, it is a point where, for a whole host of reasons, people hang on farming potentially too long, you know, and and there are. We need. We probably. It would do the industry a much better service if we had a much more dynamic industry and more young people coming in. And we can only get more young people in by making more um, opportunity effectively. And that probably does need people to retire. And and that's not a bad thing. You know, I've spoken to a client today who's just retired, just sold the farm actually, but they could have equally rented it out. And just walked away and somebody else is now running the you know a younger person's come in with young very young children basically they're now going to farm it and that's creating opportunity um by some people retiring it's not a bad thing and for some people it's the right thing to do gary i can see you want to come in there yeah i i think rob that's uh, one of the problems we've got exactly the same as you we've got clients of course mainly arable sector um however we don't know how that lump sum payment is going to be taxed at the moment um, and that's a key difference, whether it's capital or income. And I think DEFRA are in consultation with the HMRC, going to tell us in October, apparently. So, it, you know, it, I, I'm telling clients, OK, fine, think about it. But um, it, even if, it, if it's income, it's going to be taxed as income. Um, obviously, it's taxed as capital as well, to a lesser extent, pro probably. However, there's ongoing things is that, you know, you, you have you have just quite draconian. You've got to sell, gift or rent out the land. Um, and selling all your machinery is balancing charges. You know, if you're taxed on the value of machinery, Rob. Um, and so, so we, we have a lot of those. So on balance, I am telling my clients not to do it uh, at this moment in time, of course. And even when we know, I think there are there are probably, as as Rob has said, there's, uh, there's more innovative ways of actually gracefully standing aside rather than backing out and taking a lump sum. Um, so, and it's a hundred thousand, of course, so it's not for the bigger boys, it's for the, small, you know, the, yeah. the smaller farmers uh, in any case. But on balance, I think it's, it's, it's not, not for my clients, uh, is what I'm thinking. I don't know whether you agree with that, Rob. Uh, can I just add a, a no, thought no, as well? I mean, going back to your comments earlier about, you know, uh, respect in the rural community, there's a huge amount of pride associated with farmers who have farmed for many generations who hold the legacy of the land, the farm, the continuity, the community engagement. And you can give money for that. And, as, you know, as has been alluded to, it, it, it's not sufficient. But actually, you've got an individual who has a huge amount of inherent pride and that you can't just say, right, bye, see you, because, you know, there's a there's a whole element of respect and identity in that area as well. Jonathan, let's come back to you. We've talked a bit about that lump sum exit scheme, but for the benefit of people on the call, um, perhaps who don't know the full details of it, why don't we just rewind slightly? Can you explain what it does, who it's for? Yeah, just making notes because it's fascinating to hear people talk about these things. I mean, so, yeah, so the lump sum exit scheme, so we've set out the trajectory for, for direct payments in England 2028. Um, in 2024, we will... Um, what we refer to as D-Link direct payments from the land. So that means from um, 2024, you will not need to uh, fill out your uh, kind of forms every year and reclaim on an annual basis, but rather it will be um, kind of bundled up and we'll say, this is what you're, this is what you're, you're due and it'll be, be kind of rolled up um, and then provide, but they're still provided every single year. So that's D-Linking. So from 2024, still get your direct payment that you were, are to coin I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an imperfect expression, but that you're due for the remaining years of the agricultural transition to 2028. The lump sum exit scheme is from uh, is from next year. Um, for those farmers, are subject to the bunch of conditions I've just described. You can roll up your um, direct payments for those five years and take them then and then and, and then and there, uh, as long as you leave the sector. And the reason we're offering that uh, is because. Um, 
we recognize that for some farmers and it's not just about retiring it's just about if farmers will look, look at these changes go that's not for me or i was thinking of moving on anyway and rather than um doing rather than going well i'm going to get a bunch of money um for not very much for basic payments for the remaining years therefore i'm going to sit on my farm or sit in my tenancy or sit on my whatever and continuing to claim those payments until 2028 um because you know yeah, it's a pretty profitable day filling out those forms. So it's, is it worth doing? We want to break that link so people can take that money and go, well, I'm going to do something better. I'm either going to reinvest it in my farm. So when from delinking, that'd be a real option. You, you better do what you want. Um, or uh, for the lump sum exit scheme, take the money, uh, leave the agricultural sector uh, and do something do something different. And the reason we're offering that, and that, you know, that's not, that's a pretty radical policy. You, you know, it doesn't really pass the daily mail test, as they say, you know, giving with respect farmers money to roll up. And, you know, we, when we are developing it a lot, you know, talked about the risks of, far, of people spending on things which um, we wouldn't necessarily want people to spend it on. Um, but that's kind of the point. It's about we want people to be able to actively make positive choices through these changes rather than kind of hanging on. And this is what the whole of this, what this panel is about, kind of you want people to make active choices rather than kind of hanging on and um, for kind of for dear life and to, and to extract as much as they can from, from the system. Um, and the couple of points there is the decision around it being capped at £100,000 and kind of tax treatment and so on and so forth. So some big decisions to be made. So end of October, I think early November, we'll be setting out the scheme rules very mindful. I mean, Carol's points are really well made. That this is a really massive choice for farmers. It can be about a, about a year for people to act and respond. Um, it might be that we're not expecting a massive, massive take up of it um, for lots of reasons because of the scale of the change, because of the conditions we're putting around it. But what we're really hoping is that for some people it will really work. But that also will start a much bigger conversation for farmers thinking when we de-link payments, and therefore people can leave the agricultural sector and still get their remaining payments it will really catalyze thinking around that 2024 deadline. I'm not deadline, sorry, that 2024 moment when we de-link payments and people that have total freedom to step away from the sector while still re retaining that sort of rump of direct payments, which for some will still be, you know, a, a kind of fair, a fair um, sort of whack. Well, um, yeah. we've got a lot with con con concerns here, rightly so this evening. We've got a few minutes left and I just want to go around each of you and I'd like each of you to share something that you think is an opportunity amidst all of this upheaval so um uh let's start with you rob what are you excited for and what do you think will be the upside of all this upheaval um i i i think my my view is that, that there's an awful you know we've we've to a large extent, we've had stagnation of land ownership for a long, long time or land usage for quite a long time. It doesn't really move that quickly. Um, I think, you know, that there are opportunities here for some people and it might not suit big farms. And, you know, I agree with Gary, we've got some big farms that, you know, a retirement scheme with £100,000 is neither here nor there. Um, and there's other issues about retiring that will be a problem. And the you know, th there are some smaller farms or some farms that have been underinvested for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years where those issues aren't as big and there are potentially opportunities here or they find it that the new world isn't as easy and, you know, they don't have to sell farms, they don't have to give those up, they can provide them to rent or, or do joint ventures with other people. And I think as long as we can stimulate that, those sort of changes, then that creates massive opportunity for those people that want access to ground, whether it's existing farmers or new entrants. And, you know, that has to be one of the objectives of all this change to, to actually, you know, get people on the ground that understand where they're, you know, what the rules are today. There are lots of changes coming, whether that's, you know, be, partly because of things like climate change, but we're going to have things with clean air strategies. We've got more, inf um, more heavy sticks for pollution. You know, working with these is not going to be for everyone. But we need, you know, I, th I think if there's a if there is a way for some people to step back and retire, and you know, effectively allow a younger generation to take their space. You know that's got that's got to be a success for okay. for everything. All right, thanks, 
Uh, Gary, I know you're always very positive as well. What do you think is another upside? I'm really excited, actually, about all this, to be honest. And, and I'm sorry to some of the audience who are obviously very worried. Um, but I don't think they need to be. So I'm, I'm very keen on helping young people, as Rob just said, mentioned, young people coming into agriculture. We've seen joint ventures come and go over the years at ebb and flow uh, based on when times are hard, a lot of people start doing joint ventures. Price of price, the prices go up, and and we have some good seasons. Okay, we we go back into as Caroline says, we go back into our own defensive modes. Um, I think all of this change is going to drive a lot of this collaboration, and it's going to provide a lot of opportunities. Um, I, I, I and we are really pushing forward. Uh, share farming uh, as a concept, as opposed to contract farming, which uh, which will help a lot of uh, a lot of young people. These are fairly robust tax models. There's no need to worry about the tax side of it, and and the the, the farmers can gracefully retire, as we've heard from Caroline, um, or semi-retire, or not retire, uh, and have have young people involved. I, and the, the 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 other really important point, I think, is that. Um, I, I am doing family agreements every week at the moment uh, for, okay. for on succession plans. And this is kick, a lot of this worrying. I know it's a worry, but it's kick starting everything and people will get through this um, and we'll and we'll get the knowledge exchange. We'll get everything. It, it, it will work out. Uh, and we just need to, uh, I think, open up our minds. Uh, most, most of my clients, I'm telling them that they're not farmers anymore, but they're rural business people. Uh, and I think I that's am, an important concept. Thank you. I am being told we're tight for time finishing this first panel discussion. Don't forget, we have got another one coming up. Let's just have a sentence, though, from uh, you, Caroline, and then and then Jonathan to finish. Of, so I think what excites me is, um, you know, we have a climate change crisis. And in addition to that, you know, there is an opportunity that this new these new schemes create a new trust model earned recognition for those farmers who've already gone the extra mile i.e through leaf mark and in addition to that you know we're going to see new currency coming into farming and farming holds the key for supporting the health agenda and that you know that's going to be our sweet spot the day when we've kind of made the vitamin tablet industry go bust because people respect and understand the importance of nutrition and the food that we are growing because of how we are growing it and how we are looking after the environment. We hold so many of the answers, but in terms of vibrant, respected and solution driven, that's going to be absolutely key. It was one breath, but a bit more than a sentence. <laughs> Final word for you, Jonathan. Fab. Um, so I recognise that this is hard for some farmers. Some farmers would, on the call might be feeling you know, kind of stressed, and we, we we completely get that. But to end on a positive, I think the big positive is about getting getting it right. So the question at the beginning was around information that we provide. What we could have done is set everything out in a beautiful lined up PowerPoint, saying this is what's going to start here and when, and here's what we're going to do exactly. And we're going to cock it all up like we have done the last three times we've tried to do that. So so the lack of, you know, it might feel like we haven't set out exactly what SFI is going to look like or exactly what LNR is going to look like, but that is an opportunity for us to get it right. So we're actively listening and learning and making things better the whole time. So this lack of clarity, as some would describe it, is real, but from our perspective, it's about getting it right. And that's the, the big opportunity, I think, for a really exciting agricultural sector delivering net zero and wildlife. And the way that we're approaching that, I think gives a much better chance of getting that right. Although completely get it can feel a bit frustrating. Thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic way to end our first panel discussion. My thanks once more to Jonathan, Rob, Caroline, and Gary for being so generous with their time and expertise this evening. And thank you to AHDB, of course, for their video too. You'll find more information about the support they can offer under the resources tab on the right of your screen. We're gonna roll straight into our second discussion in a few moments where we delve deeper into a look at how some farmers have made benchmarking bench work for them. But first it's time for our second transition partner video of the evening from Oxbury Bank. Let's watch that now, and I'll introduce our next guests afterwards. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to offer Oxbury Bank's partner perspective during this first transition summit hosted by Farmers Weekly. 
I'm Tim Coates, and as well as being Oxbury's Chief Customer Officer, I am myself an arable farmer navigating the complexities of the agricultural transition. It's very clear that farmers' financial positions will change markedly as the BPS is withdrawn and Elms develops. Our view is that that change brings opportunity, but that requires financial preparation. As we've already heard, the figures are stark. Depending on the type of farm, BPS makes up a considerable proportion of net farm income. Take it away and many farmers are facing a loss. But there are things which can be done to prepare for the changes ahead, not least of which is a thorough understanding of the financial position of your farm. By budgeting and cash flow forecasting, you can understand the real impact of BPS withdrawal. Having a clear picture of the years ahead means you can then work with trusted partners to come up with a solid and successful plan for the future. So take a look at the internal and external factors affecting your business in the coming years. Internal factors include assets, labour, overheads, diversification opportunities and joint ventures. External factors might be climate change, input costs, policy changes and finance costs. Note that a new DEFRA grant is now available to support farmers with external advice on transition through approved partners. I've already taken this up and I recommend you do the same. Be frank about the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats affecting your farm. Only by analysing your business in such a way can you then decide on the best route forward, whether that's improving efficiencies by adopting new technology, diversification, joining forces to reduce overheads or scaling back to add value through increased margin. Whatever you decide to do, make sure it's something that people involved in the business can get behind and will be committed to. And make sure you plan and implement changes in partnership with advisors you trust, whether that's a farm consultant, accountant or bank. This will avoid unexpected implications and ensure you have appropriate and specialised lending in place. That in mind, here comes the hard sell. When it comes to financing any changes, it's vital that your lender really understands your needs and the journey you are on to get the best package for you. For example, a long-term capital project like diversification will require something like an Oxbury farm loan structured from six months to 25 years. Or you could seek to put in place our exclusive working capital facility to fund farm inputs, Oxbury farm credit. Or we could be able to offer a new line of flexible credit for you for those unexpected cash flow moments through Oxbury Flexi Credit. Other considerations include choosing between fixed or variable rates, interest only terms or repayments that match the seasonality and needs of your business. At Oxbury, we only lend to farmers. We are 100% an agricultural bank and our services and products are designed specifically to meet farmers needs now and in the future. I myself farm across Oxfordshire and most of the bank staff have farming backgrounds, so we are fully invested in helping you make a successful transition and secure a profitable future for British agriculture. At my farm, I've planned several changes in preparation for transition, fully aware that 50% of my gross income is threatened by the BPS withdrawal. As a result, I've entered new joint ventures, enabling a greater reach to support neighbouring farm businesses and investing in assets which the wider area requires, as well as continuing my journey into regenerative agriculture and ecosystem services provision. So I know from first-hand experience that quick decisions on financing are vital to help businesses take best advantage of what are sometimes fleeting opportunities. At Oxbury, we make the best use of technology data and personal relationships to ensure that loan applications are robustly analysed, but then quickly approved, so our lending is both responsible and responsive. And when making borrowing decisions, it's important not to be hamstrung by being too ambitious in your repayment plans. The key is to plan for success, but be prepared for bumps in the road. Cash is king. So budgets and applications for lending should always include a cash flow forecast to identify future pinch points. Oxbury Farm Credit is designed to meet farmers' cash flow needs, working with a range of agricultural partners that you trust, like Frontier, Hutchinson's and Winstay, among others, to offer flexible farm credit on input finance. This means you can buy inputs when you need them and pay when it suits you. With everything monitored on our online platform, you're in complete control. Sustainability, both financial and environmental, is absolutely key for us, for you and the world in which we live. And that's why from founding, we have been a completely carbon neutral bank and we fully support the transition to net zero by 2040. As a bank, we're doing things differently to put British farming on a stronger footing for the future. As a farmer, I'm making the changes to protect and enhance my business in the coming years. And I know that with the right support, all farmers can come through the agricultural transition stronger and more resilient. We'd love you to get in touch with your plans for the transition. And thank you for listening. My thanks to them, all the transition partners, and particularly my new beautiful panel of people who are here to talk a little bit more about benchmarking, get under the skin of it in the dairy and the cereals sector. I'm delighted to be joined by KWS Value Chain Manager, Kirsty Richards, Arla's Global Senior Manager in Commercial Agriculture, Joe Lawrence, Suffolk Arable Farmer and Contractor, Andrew Howard, 
and Lanarkshire dairy farmer Jim Baird. Jim, I'm going to come straight to you. It says here in my notes that you have facilitated dairy benchmarking for over 35 businesses in your area. We talked a lot about the big picture in that first session, but for farmers who really want to hone in on their businesses and improve their productivity or achieve another objective, they need to benchmark. Is that the case? Yeah, d definitely. And, and, uh, and on top of that, I would say uh, benchmarking within discussion groups is the most valuable approach to, to doing so. Um, in my experience, um, do you, just that camaraderie, uh, kind of accountability, the, even the wee bit compare development that you get within a discussion group, uh, and just that the structure and, and the, you know you can bring in facilitators who 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 kind of keep you on your metal, keep keep the, the, the structure of the discussion right, keep challenge and stimulate. And uh, yeah, it's a model that was developed in New Zealand at the time when when um, subsidies were were removed in New Zealand and and they had to to learn very quickly. And 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 I think in the long run, it did the, the New Zealand industry a lot of good. And maybe the current climate we're heading towards. It might, it might instill similar kind of business thinking within the UK agriculture as well. Well, look, I'm just going to tackle it head on. We know how busy uh, dairy farmers are. I'm sure you've been you've given them this pitch and they've said, Jim, look, I'm, I'm just too busy driving the tractor, doing the milking, 101 other jobs. I just can't, I haven't got the time. I can't be bothered to sit in the office. What do you say to them then? It's, it's going to be a competitive industry going forward, and and, it, and it's going to require true professionalism. And and you know any professional business, you know, has to understand its cost structure, has to understand you know uh, you know what will drive profitability in its business. And 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 the guys who embrace that and take that on will be the guys who will be here for the future. And the guys who don't will will you know will will fall by the wayside. And and you know and that's that's the reality of the situation. Now, you don't quite have the detailed roadmap like English farmers that's given the sort of definite end point to subsidy payments. But is your advice to Scottish farmers when you're talking to them, you know, look, we can't rely on these either? Or do you think there's going to be, you know, always a bit more payment up with you guys and perhaps south of the border? I think we're all on the same journey. I, th I think maybe we're we're going to be a, a step or two behind, but I think the the direction of travel is going to be the same. And and and, uh, and I think I think most business minded farmers are 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 ready for that. Are are, are thinking towards that. You know that we're going to have to live in an environment where where subsidies are are going to be at least very different and probably a lot less. And and uh, and, and from a dairy industry perspective, we're not we're not as dependent on subsidies as, as some of other sectors are. And you know, when we do comparable farm profit benchmarking, for example, we don't put the subsidy in; it's not in there. So, it's, so it, you know, it, it, um, it, it brings that reality home to people that we need to make a profit without without subsidy. And and I think um, I think environmental issues might be a bigger impact in dairy farming, and we need to, you know, I'm sure the Arla will get a good perspective on that. But uh, but there's opportunities there as well. But yeah, I think. From a subsidy perspective, I think dairy's got a reasonably good story, and 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 it's it's how we, how we can we can drive that forward. Well, that's a perfect point to bring in, Joe. Then, Joe, would you agree with Jim there that perhaps subsidy isn't the number one, or the losing subsidy isn't the number one concern for the Isla farmers that you talk to? Uh, if not, then then what is it, and how are you helping them tackle it? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to subsidy payments and and that kind of part of it our farmer owners business we don't get that involved our mission working for our farmer owners is very much about how do we create the highest value for for their milk uh, and for us we've really seen that priority in focusing in our brands so we've grown our brands by 85 percent since 2015 and we feel a, a key reason for that is because we really focus on driving the things that are very aligned to our consumers moral compass so around the sustainability aspect and also um, animal welfare and that's what we do through um, the programs that we run so whether it be the Arla Garden program that we have or obviously the climate check program as well. 
And are your members sort of then happy to, uh, do you think, share their information and have a bit of transparency up and down the supply chain? Should farmers be gathering data not just for themselves, but also right up to the consumer, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I would 100% agree. And that's what we've seen through um, the climate check. So this year has been the year one of our climate check data. So throughout 2020, our farmers submitted their uh, data for the climate check report. They had a follow up visit from an advisor. But out of all of our 2,200 UK farmers, we've been able to aggregate that data and from that identify what are the key opportunities for farmers to drive improvements in their carbon footprint um, so then all of our members can then take that information and apply it to their farm because we know every farm is different but what we've done through aggregating and sharing everyone's data is be able to show where the opportunities are so that like I say a farmer can take that and apply it to their business. Okay well Andrew um, welcome to you as well I uh, appreciate you being with us, particularly at a, a busy time of year. How's the harvest gone, first of all? Uh, very much a mixed bag. Um, started off with very good barley and very average wheat yields, is what I'd suggest. Very low bushel weights, but uh, continual damp weather. So it's been a challenge. And have you finished combining or is there still more to do? Uh, we have, thankfully. We finished on Thursday last week. So the, the interesting thing, you know, for here at Farmers Weekly, obviously we've been keeping a close eye on that. We, look, everyone's talking about how high the, the, the grain prices are at the moment, but also costs have gone up too. Fertiliser in particular is going to be a real worry. We're hearing today about the closure of the CF factories and we, we, we're thinking about wondering how high those fertiliser prices are going. So for you, it must be that you know it's not about the grain price it's not about the input price it's simply about that margin that must be the number one thing you're measuring right totally absolutely i mean we're sweet with as much as we take at the top we've been squeezed very hard from the bottom um and it's something that never seems to change unfortunately but no that is it, it's it's very hard to to maintain a margin there but uh, that's the whole point of this benchmarking is to make sure that we are you know we are still viable and can survive it's uh, crucial and for an arable farmer then that's on the call uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, maybe delegates that at the moment, maybe doesn't even do it or doesn't do it as well as they would like to. Just tell us a bit about how you got into this and sort of what the what are the key things that you're you're capturing and, and, and how difficult is it? OK, so um, I, was, I started benchmarking various aspects of the business probably 15 or 20 years ago, but not in a terribly good way it was it was a little bit um wayward some of the information and didn't really trust any any of the data coming from different sources um and four years ago i joined a ground groundswell benchmarking group which is uh, run by gary markham of land family business um and that's a group of um i would suggest 12 or 15 businesses um of vastly varying sizes um and that is phenomenal the, the the group is what makes that benchmarking work it's having the the trust in the other people trusting them that they're putting the right data in and that inspires you to put to sit down and put your data in correctly and um regarding how long it takes you know it, it, it doesn't take long a lot of the detail comes from from your latest set of accounts which is all there to see everybody knows their yields everybody knows what kit they're running you can see how much you're spending on field. You can see how much you're spending on labour. So it it seems a big deal when you when you initially say, "Oh yes, I'll start. I'll join a benchmarking group," um, and you sit down for the first time and think, "Wherever am I going to start?" But when you put your mind to it, spend half an hour looking at it and thinking, "Okay, this is the information we need. This is where we're going to source it from." It's it's not difficult, and it is crucial. And Kirsty, um, welcome to you as well. You know, fundamentally, you're part of the supply chain. You're interested in farmers being successful for a host of reasons. You know, how worried would you say the 
co community of businesses around our farmers is at the moment with the changes that are coming you know is there is there real concern out there that the upheaval is going to affect the whole supply chain or is this more just a farmer problem would you say no um well hello everyone and um i i would say no it's very much a whole supply chain issue as we see it um as plant breeders we're right at the start of the grain chain and um and, and we take a great responsibility in providing information about the products that that you guys are growing um i would say that from a plant breeding perspective it takes us something like 13 years to get a variety to the marketplace so um our job really is to create as much genetic diversity um, so that by the time that we get 13 years down the road and you guys are looking at the next product to drill, we've we've got something to suit most situations. And we know, obviously, that the past 10 years have been immensely different in terms of the, the weather conditions and patterns that we're experiencing. Um, like Andrew intimated, the harvest hasn't been great for many people um, and also drilling wasn't particularly good in terms of the, the weather with the heavy wet, uh, rains that stopped people getting on so we're looking for very sort of uh, flexible products that we perhaps weren't 15 20 years ago um, and we're we're constantly really looking for products to work hand in hand with the inputs that farmers are using on the farm so it's not just about looking at getting um, just the right genetics about that whole package of choosing genetics, choosing the chemistry that go with the genetics, the inputs and, and creating a profitable crop for the farmer. So I would say it's, it's a whole supply chain concern um, and only really success will come when we all start talking to each other even more than we already do. Obviously, we want to be growing things. Um, we want to be developing products. Farmers need to be growing things that the end consumer is ultimately going to buy. And it feels like the, the seed breeders are really focusing at the moment, including yourselves, on, on breeding crops. Is it fair to say that we are focusing on those resilience traits rather than perhaps a, just focusing on being a total barn buster? <laughs> is, 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 is that what farmers are coming to you and saying, this is what I want, I want to cut my bills, I want to, I'm looking at my margin, not just at my revenue here? And is, is that why you're doing it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you you just clearly important because obviously the first thing Andrew mentioned was margin so yield is, is clearly going to be an important consideration in any crop production system but it is about producing varieties that are more resilient as we said the weather has got more extreme events um, for some last year there were very severe frosts in April due to very poor flowering time um, when, when sort of things are happening in the plant and um, when there's a lot of development going on. So we need to be pro providing these sort of robust varieties that can cope with the differences in climate that we're seeing. And also, as we've said, um, with less chemistry being available, they need to be resilient in terms of pest and disease resistance, which of course is constantly changing and becoming more and more of a challenge. So it certainly is about a whole array of um, items that we look at for plant varieties for the future. It's not just about yield. And, and Andrew, then, uh, just to come back to you on that, you know, how are you communicating what you learn back to those businesses that work with you? And, and, and what have you sort of learnt? Uh, and we'll ask the same question of the, the dairy sector after, because it's about, it's about that conversation, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Sorry, can you just repeat that question? I'm not sure I understood that. So when you learn something from your benchmarking, maybe about what's performing best or you've identified a weak part of your business, are you then going out and talking to the businesses that you work with and, and, and looking for that help to solve that problem? It's not just behind the farm gate, is it? It's about the businesses that work with you too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would suggest that most of it relates to my business and our business and actions that we take. Um, I mean, there's obviously discussion with wider industry and you know, other farming clients that I work with, but most of those decisions and most of those, uh, most of that information that comes from the benchmarking, I, I respond to those, to that, um, to those figures and that information in my own business. Okay. And, and Jim, then, is that, is that the same for you? You know, are you, do you think you're more likely to know how to go out and, and look for help then and sort of what help perhaps in your business have you looked for based on what you've learned? Yeah, as I think one example would be in, in the vet and med side, you know, in the, in the, in the dairy industry. 
you know, when we benchmark within groups, the, the, the benchmark number, the, the KPI is, is, is around a penny a litre, you know, in vet and med. And, and, uh, and then there's quite a range within within the groups, obviously, as, as, as you would expect. And, you know, there's some people a penny and a half and there's some people half a penny. And, and, and that's something that, you know, I find certainly I have done, you know, I've gone back to the vets and, and, and we, we assess where we're spending, where's the vet and med, what areas are we spending on? And, uh, and, and assess how we can be maybe more pre- proactive in, in terms of, let's say, vaccines and the likes to prevent, you know, some of the ailments that, that we're, we're coming up against. And, and I, I found that within other groups as well, you know, it's quite system related, you know, some of the high input guys have got very high vet bills and, 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 and you know, it's just trying to engage with, you know, uh, even the cost, what people are paying with different vet practices and that, it's been it's been quite an eye opener for some people, and and it, you know it's just about trying to make sure that uh, everyone's working towards a, a, a more positive outcome, and, and, and uh, yeah, and it's been quite powerful in that. And uh, so when you find something out of key, you drill down harder to see where, where it's where it's going wrong. But, uh, so so yeah. so vet and med, that's probably one of the biggest areas. Then when there's a variation within the members of your group, what are, what are the other ones, and what can farmers be looking for then in their own costs? I think feed is, is another big area uh, and uh, you know um, what we what we find and I shouldn't say this in front of a milk buyer but it, is that it, actual milk price doesn't relate strongly to profitability uh, when we're benchmarking and uh, what, what relates is it's very much cost of production you know if you if you plotted milk price or uh, versus profitability it's just a scatter graph but if you pr- plot cost of production versus profitability is a very distinct line and uh, so so that shows you that in a lot of ways it's under the, the business's control a lot of those costs are are really things that folk can work on and can and can and can control so um so that's that's a f- one key point i would put but but yeah every system has different pressure points and and uh, for high yielding systems for example feed is a massive thing um, and and you you know some people throw an awful amount of feed at things and, and you think how can they make money at, at that feed level and 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 it, it, it's same um, but it, it's system dependent and you and you have to make sure that the KPIs that you're measuring are relevant to your system they're relevant to your business and 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 that's one of the, the key things about a discussion group is is when we sit down with each other we know each other's businesses well we we know the you know the, 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 how how we're different. And, and, and so that's the challenge when you're sometimes generically benchmarking that you don't know that what you're doing in your business is relevant to the people you're benchmarking against. But if you're in a group of guys that you know, it, it's much more clear where the, the wins and the losses are. And, um... Joe, do you want to come in there, you know, um, in the groups that you work with? What are the, any other big variations? Feed, vet and meds? Where are the other areas perhaps uh, that farmers should be looking first of all if they're starting out benchmarking and they think what are the things that i should be focusing on yeah i mean i keep going back to it but with that climate check data and, and aggregating it together across all of our own as we saw these big five levers so how f- your feed efficiency uh how you produce your feed um your manure handling your energy and then kind of um other like smaller parts but five big levers and I think we all know don't we that if the more carbon efficient you are it's generally correlated with how profitable and efficient you are as a business so that's for us towards our farmer owners we're saying focus on those five big levers look at where for your business there's the opportunities because I know speaking to some members they're looking at the five levers and they know they're already performing really well on feed efficiency and feed production but actually the areas they need to improve on and how they manage their slurry how they apply their slurry so that's where they're going to be focusing their kind of attention and investments going forwards. Jump in there Andrew uh, what are the what are the key ones then for the arable sector? Well, it's I mean, they jump out <laughs> jump out the accounts every year. I mean, it's um, the depreciation, fuel costs, labour. Um, yeah, it's, it's those ones. It's those ones. They're just there every year, and they are the biggies. And uh, the benchmarking does allow us to drill into them a lot more, rather rather than just looking at them as a big figure every year. We you know we can compare to others, and it gives us scope to um, 
to, to, to manage them as well. So yeah, they're, they're, they're the ones that are the big ones. So let's talk about depreciation then. Do you think the sector is still sort of over mechanized? Are the big tractor manufacturers going to be in trouble in 10 years time because we've all um, worked out we can manage with fewer? Undoubtedly, <laughs> undoubtedly. Yeah, it's um, the days of uh, buying tractors just uh, because we fancy a new tractor are long gone. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think uh, machinery manufacturers are going to feel the pain just as much as uh, as the farms and growers. And what about the seed sector then? There must be an awful lot of money you're spending there. If only that could be cut in half, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Is that, uh, yeah, in terms of developing? Yes, of course, that would be ideal, wouldn't it? But um, I think... Um, I think from our perspective, it, it's about being able to provide a product for farmers that's very consistent. So we talked about this uh, climatic change and that the sort of extreme weather events that we're seeing in the future. And when it comes to benchmarking, it's about looking for products that give you a consistent return, no matter the uh, the sort of season that you're experiencing. So the more resilience in terms of disease resistance, how, you know, standing ability and, and, and all of that. But um, a bit like Audrey said, really, go back to machinery, you know, um, thinking about what portfolio varieties, what your rotation is, um, how much time you're going to spend traveling around looking in your tractor with your sprayer, looking after these varieties and, and thinking about, you know, how you position your varieties in each field across the farm to get the best out of it. And, you know, look at opportunities to decrease work rates or look at variety scheduling, the order in which you're trying to drill varieties and how that will impact on what your movements at harvest time will be and moving your combine around the farm when products hit maturities at, at very different rates. So there's an awful lot to consider for sure. Kirsty, we we talked a bit about sort of end to end sharing of some of this information in the in the dairy sector, and I see from my notes, you know, you you've had a big push on looking at that in the arable sector too. Do you think, you know, is there a correlation between successful farmers being the ones who are sort of willing to share that data? Because I know some farmers are quite reticent about, you know, um, being being open about their sort of profitability in particular because they're worried they'll just be taken advantage of in that case. Yeah, I can understand that. I think, um, you know, if we can think about the grain supply chain as a whole, we've all been guilty of our various sectors staying within our individual sections. So, you know, a, a sort of a processor may not be talking to a farmer particularly, but certainly over the past 15 years, we've seen the, the chain become much more transparent. Um, which is a good thing because there's a lot of uh, information we can share. And I think there's a lot of good things that uh, farmers are doing, um, our products in cereals, uh, because of the certification system, everything is completely traceable. Um, if you buy something on the shelf in Sainsbury's or, or whatever supermarket, other supermarkets are available, um, then, you know, that actually, um, the, the wheat that produced that product can actually be traced back to the plant breeder and the actual ultimate cross. And, and that's something I think that by understanding that sort of availability of information across the supply chain, people can actually capitalise and, and do more really to um to sort of uh, work together and i think we could probably learn something from the uh the dairy and the meat industry about being more open and transparent in the grain train and i suppose the first thing a farmer will say then is uh he or she will say you know if i tell you more do you think there'll be a, a premium in it for me do you think if we communicate better there'll be financial opportunities perhaps up and down the supply chain maybe with the millers or the maltsters or what's the <laughs> what's the value of it yeah i can't guarantee that but i guess you'd be in a better situation to provide the right specification of product um if you shared the information about it um with them so that you're actually delivering what what they want and gaining the premium that you have agreed to get already. Andrew, I bet you've got a few thoughts on that. Often, <laughs> you know, things go in and out of spec seemingly on a whim. Yeah, springs to mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, there's no doubt growing for the market is um, is very, very important. Um, I'm yet to see a massive um, price premium for delivering what's expected. 
rather than a price reduction I was meaning. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, yeah, a scepticism, I'm afraid. But perhaps that's something that, you know, the, the arable sector could learn from the dairy sector then. You know, there's been a lot of complaints in the last decade uh, about sort of not enough branding and shouldn't we be more like Ireland and without improving our export markets? You know, what are the, th what are the key things we need to do um, here in the UK, do you think, Jim? Uh, and then I'll come to you after, Joe, to sort of maybe improve together collectively as well as individually. Well, I think that I think Joe's. I think it's been mentioned in the Alice situation. You know, when carbon footprinting is going to be a huge thing going forward for our industry, and uh, I've never seen anything move so quickly as I have this whole carbon debate in the last two years. It's just been it's gone from being something everybody was kind of thinking about to something that everyone is desperately trying to do something. And and and, uh, and it's. I think. The key thing is how, how we monetize that. How do we actually get the benefit of it? Because there's a lot of good stories within the dairy industry about about what we can do, and and in terms of uh, the the carbon uh, sequestration, that, you know, that especially in pasture farming, is uh, there's huge possibilities there. But it's, it's how do we how do we actually measure that? Make it accountable get a reward for it is, is the big thing and then you can see i can see what all are trying to do and first are trying to do the same thing and and um but i think it, it needs a bit more standardization it needs a bit more uh understanding of the rule book and a bit more appreciation of some of the how methane is treated and things like that you know uh, it, it, there's a lot of issues that need to be resolved because everyone's trying to do something but no one's quite sure what they need know what they need to do and, and how they're going to get something back for it well, let, let, let's tackle carbon in particular head on then, Joe. I know Arla's having a big push to talk about carbon footprint, how farmers in your group have reduced that already, you know, the road to net zero. You know, are, are all your members sort of done a carbon audit already then? And, and how, does it, how much work is it to measure that on an ongoing basis? So of the year one climate check, we had just over 1,900 farmers complete it uh, and then it's it is a lot of work and we do appreciate so it's a 203 questions that the farmers have to submit data against so yes I appreciate there is a lot to kind of put in to start with uh, but going back to the points that were made before if you take the time to really put that quality data in all the farmers who participate then have a follow-up visit with a, a trained advisor who can go through their data and kind of then start to work with them and plan on where are the opportunities, things that they should start to focus on. Um, and coming back to, you know, farmers feeling like they feel they've got a lot to do. I think having that one-to-one -one advice with advisors is super helpful and important because it's all about starting the journey so yes there's a lot of data and there's probably lots of things farmers can do but actually what's going to be the first step just start small and then it kind of builds from there and and how do you respond to the sort of the cynicism in part of the industry that says you know actually consumers don't care they just buy on price you know, are you, why is Arla so certain that this is going to be a marketing point for them? Well, I feel like I mentioned earlier with the growth of our brands, that growth of 85% since 2015, that is driven through the fact that we are driving the agenda of health and welfare and now particularly on our carbon journey. And that so aligns with where consumers uh, feel their values are and they want to buy products that are aligned to their values. Um, so that's why we feel it's so important to make sure that we are on these kind of journeys to then add that value, that consumer's value, so we can deliver back to our farmers and their and their bottom line. Okay. And and so be it carbon, Jim, or, or, or be it sort of farm data, you've got to collect it, you've got to understand it, and then closing that loop is, is taking action on it. How, is that the hardest part of all, would you say, or is that the easy bit? Yeah, yeah, I think it's quite a challenging bit because, you know, we see a discussion group, we, we, we go through and, and we talk through each of the businesses and talk about 
where their strong points are and where their weak points are. And and it always comes to the end of the meeting and, and you say, well, what's the, what's the so what of that? What, what, what are you going to do different going forward to, 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 to change that so that when we, we meet in six months' time or a year's time, that number is going to be different? And that's... That is always the, the challenging bit, and, and it's something you, it's a critical bit of the meeting where you 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 write it down and then and you send it round, and everyone when they come back the next time has that in black and white, and, and says, right, well, what did I do? I said I was going to do this. What did I do? Why didn't I do what I said I was going to do? And uh, and and the challenge with benchmarking is is that it's it's a bit like driving looking in a rear view mirror because it's it's historical before you before you even sit down and do it, you know, and. Um, and, and I suppose what the true business-minded farmers that are budgeting and and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're saying, well, what is it going to look like in a year's time? What's it going to look like in two years' time? And and uh, and, and they're, they're assessing different scenarios and, and doing different, uh, considering different r- routes forward. And, and 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 what does that mean for me? And and whether that be if milk price does this, what am I going to do if? If it does that, what am I going to do? If and, and and similarly, if subsidies go, you know, what's it all going to look like, and what am I going to do? And that, you know, our industry is, you know, if we're honest, is not, you know, we're not gold standard in that front, and there's not there's not enough businesses that are are thinking and, and doing these kind of things, and and I think that's where, we, as an industry, we we do need to get to. And Andrew, you know, what steps have you taken then to start getting ready for the the end of subsidy, and and how close to being ready are you? Would you say? Um, I would say I'm much like everybody else. I'm looking at it and I'm trying to understand where we've got to go. Um, well, I mean, we are cutting costs wherever we can, fuel being one, machinery costs another, labour another. Um, we are in the process and starting um, down the road of regenerative agriculture, direct drilling, um, with the obvious aim of cutting fuel use. And... Um, Custom machinery costs, and of course, with the hope that we can start selling carbon credits somewhere. Um, it's carbon credits is a little bit of a, a muddy game at the moment. There doesn't really seem to be anything definitive or anywhere definitive to sell or market or even a credit. What we are doing, um, there's one or two businesses that claim to be able to do it, and I have been in discussion with one of them certainly, but. It doesn't seem to be a definite market yet. I hope it is, because that's going to be quite important to us. So do you think on your farm then, or perhaps for the arable sector as a whole, they are sort of betting on another income stream where there will need to be something like carbon or biodiversity, be it elms or the, the uh, you know, a, a private sector scheme? You know, it's, it's not that you will be able to manage without something like that. I, I think to think that Elms is going to be a um, big income stream would be very foolhardy. Um, yes, I mean, we are all looking for alternative income streams. I think perhaps a private, um, private carbon trading or private stewardship, maybe um, private greening options for people. I think possibly that that might be a goer. I hope it is. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I'm, I'm not sure that Elms is going to be very exciting. No more than income foregone. Yeah. So is it, you know, are you wanting to lobby DEFRA and get them to provide an improved package or are you just saying, I will do the legal minimum, but I'm going to try and not, you know, focus too much on, on additional ass from government. I'm just going to paddle my own canoe. I think it would be foolish to not sharpen up your business to prepare for nothing, prepare for no government assistance. If we get it or if we get something, great. And I think it's going to be very, very important to the rural economy that we do. But I think to not or or to assume you're going to get something would be quite dangerous. And and just describe, you know, if you're looking into your crystal ball, then, uh, by 2028, when subsidies, uh, the first year when you're getting no BPS payment, you know, how different to today do you think your business will look then? <laughs> the I know that's a tough question. The crystal ball is quite murky at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would suggest that there'll be businesses like mine that have expanded considerably. 
and I would suggest there have been an awful lot of small businesses that have disappeared and large businesses as well. Heavily financed, heavily borrowed businesses. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure it's going to be too, too pretty. Joe and, and Jim, which one of you would like to answer the question, how much consolidation is there going to be in the dairy sector then? <laughs> I mean, go oh, on, were you going to go, Jim? No, and you go, Joe. <laughs> no, I say, like, I guess we don't, for, for us as Arla, we are obviously wanting to create the future of dairy. We're all in this dairy together and we all need the industry to be successful so for us it is all about how do we so we're talking about benchmarking so yes there's a definite value to the data on an individual farm level but for us as well what we've been able to do through year one of having all this data from our farmers via the climate check program is now we can start having these conversations with our customers so retailers and then also with government as well so it's is all about sharing that knowledge now and how do we grow the dairy category uh, educate our consumers um, so that they better understand dairy and we can kind of mitigate some of this misinformation about dairy and its negative impact because now we've got the data and the proof points uh, to be able to back that up. So if I'd pass the crystal ball over to you then how different is the sort of typical Isla member by the time subsidy runs out compared to how they look today then? They're doing a huge amount of environmental work, but perhaps the actual business of milk production, is that fairly similar or is that different, do you think? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. So how different will the sort of dairy farm of 2028 be to the dairy farm of today then, do you think? Is there still big changes that your members will have to implement? Yeah, and I think we we know that there's still a lot of unknowns within dairy and how we need to farm and how we can advance how we farm to be more sustainable, etc. So again, there's a lot of conversations to be had and that's why having farmers measure and manage what they're doing and sharing that data fuels those conversations so that we can actually innovate and understand what are gonna be the things we need to do going forward to benefit everybody, not just to deliver something uh, to a consumer, but also to support farmers in how they run their business and, and become more efficient. Jim, what's it going to be like on the ground for you? Yeah, I think to answer your consolidation question, you know, the dairy industry has consolidated forever and a day. You know, there has been a something like a, a five percent or something of that elk decline forever, and, and but the number of cows in the country have stayed the same, but the number of farmers have 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 have, have Cut significantly, and uh, and and I think that will continue, I, I, and and perhaps some of this will, will accelerate some of that. But it, but it's just it is the way of the world, and and, and that's uh, you can put a positive spin in some of this stuff, you know, because you know, you know, if you look to, to New Zealand for example, which I mentioned before, there was a huge amount of positives to, to having no subsidies, and and uh, you know, arguably all subsidies become capitalised into land and to, we all pay more for rents, we pay more for machinery, young people can't get into industry. You know, you know, without a lot of that stuff, you know, perhaps there'll be a much more succession, much more young people able to take on farms and, and, and you know, get a foot in the ladder, which is, just can't happen away in, in a lot of cases at the moment. So, so there, there's real, there is potential positives in this and, and, and I think the businesses that are and the front foot and and ready to embrace what's going to happen will we'll be the ones who will will crack on and move forward and 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 if you bury your head in the sand and pretend it's not going to happen well maybe you'll be one of the casualties of it at that time i think that's a fair point so we've got a few minutes left uh, 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 bef uh before we end i'd like to go around each of you then it's nice that you picked up on a on a positive note there jim um you know, because it is easy to focus on the negatives, and we tried to do both in the last discussion. I'd like to do it in in this discussion too. Let's come to you first, perhaps, Kirsty. You know, what are the upsides of the next ten years, and and what's your one piece of advice, perhaps, for for a farmer on the call? I think um, from a cereals perspective, it's an opportunity to revisit rotations again and look at perhaps 
crops that you haven't looked at in the past. So there are crops such as something like rye, which is looking like a new market sector in terms of um, uh, going into the feed animal feed industry, or uh, or maybe eventually we will get them integrated into the milling and distilling supply chains once we need to, need to do some work to do that. But there are opportunities um, in perhaps looking at new crops in your same situation. Andrew. Um, I think, you know, Jim sort of fairly encapsulated it quite well, really, that, you know, young entrants is going to be a good way or, or potentially a good way for young entrants to get in farming because the route in is almost impossible unless you are very, very lucky with um, a grandfather who passes his thousand acres to you. It's almost impossible to get in. So I think I think we're going to see young people with lots of new new ideas. So. Yeah, let's hope that let's hope that is the cloud of the silver lining. Okay, Joe, what about you? The next ten years. Mm, what's the upside? Uh, the upside, well, for us, we're on this uh, mission to reduce our carbon footprint by thirty percent by twenty thirty. That's kind of ten years away. I know in twenty twenty one. And we know what the first few steps are on that journey. But beyond that is, like I said before, a bit of an unknown. And it's going to require a lot of uh, collaboration and innovation across the whole supply chain uh, and working with governments as well. Coming back to the points that were raised before, um, we are having to think long term now. And for farmers, they don't always get that immediate return on the investments that they're making. So it's how do we make sure that there is that long term pay off and like I say what collaborations do we need across the supply chains to do that so for me a huge upside is hopefully going to be much more collaboration much more transparency uh, end to end. Jim any more positivity from you I'm sure there's another few chats up your sleeve. <laughs> yeah well I think we're all going to have to be more efficient and and uh, you know and, and it's like Evan you can't stand still in this world you know the, the 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 bar keeps getting higher all the time and we have to get better and and just to finish on the benchmark and you know and you know if you're in the top quartile you you've nothing to fear I think you've you got a, you know you you're you're in a good place and if you're if you're in the bottom quartile well I, I would fear for you and, and it's the guys in the middle that have really got to work their socks off to get a, you know at least above average because it's going to be a competitive world and. And you know, as I say, you just got to keep keep cracking on and, and and trying to keep jumping that bar. I just want to pick you up on that, though. We haven't got long left now, but you know, at Farmers Weekly, we're always very careful when we write stories about how farmers need to improve because farmers say, you know, some farmers say, "I'm sick of that. I've been told that. We've been told that for years. I'm already doing the best that I can do." But is there, you know? When you, from your benchmarking experience, would you say then the sort of let's call the average farmer, if there is such a thing, you know, is there still more that they can do? How how big is the gap between the best and the rest? I suppose. So there's always there's always more you can do. Every day is a school day, as I say, and and, and if you're prepared to learn and prepared to, you know, that's why I did a farm walk here the other day, and that was what I said. You know, you. You can always learn from experience of other people. That's the beauty of discussion groups, the the, 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 the experience and, and the learnings that other folk have had. And, and that's the beauty that folk are quite willing to share that and because uh, they always feel they'll get something back, you know. And, and uh, you know, if anyone thinks that they're as efficient as they can be, well, I would fear for them because, uh, you know, farm is no different from any other business. You've got to keep, keep you know, the demands of the customer get higher all the time and, and uh, the world keeps moving. If you stand still, you know that, that's not that's not what you want to be. At. And and Andrew, just a sort of similar question on the arable side. Of course, you know farmers have to cope with the things out of their control, like weather, climate, and soil type. But if we set those aside for a minute, there's still a gap between the best and the rest in in the in the arable sector too. Then is there with things that are under under the control of farmers? Absolutely. I mean that that is that. Yeah. There's. The, it's, there's always going to be an average, and there's always going to be the lower quartile and the upper quartile. And uh, yeah, absolutely, the, the ones in the lower quartile have got to strive to be in the middle, and the middle has got to be striving to be at the top. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's what the benchmarking demonstrates to you. You can see where you are, mm-hmm. and it's easy to discuss the benchmarking results. The difficult bit is actioning it, but you have to action some of it, even if you don't do everything. You've, you've got to action something. Mm-hmm. 
Very good. Well, look, we are just about running out of time. I'm going to say thank you very much to our second panel, Andrew, Jim, Kirsty, and Jay. You've all been terrific, and I hope the dairy and the the uh, cereal farmers on the call can take something away from that. We'll delve a bit more into beef and sheep and the other sectors another time. Well, there we are. I hope you agree with me that the last two hours have absolutely flown by and given you all much food for thought on starting to prepare for the end of subsidy payments and adapting to new environmental schemes. Thank you to Oxbury for that video. And thank you to our panel, as I say here, and our previous panel too, both uh, given a great amount of insight. And I hope that if you think like me that they've said a lot of worthy things that somebody else who is not at this presentation this evening will benefit from hearing then please do remember that you can share this with other people who can watch it on demand. Don't forget that this is just the first of our five summits with the next show taking place at 5 p.m. on the 18th of November when we'll be talking about the road to net zero in more detail. I hope we won't generate too much hot air ourselves. Had to get a dad joke in there somewhere. I'd like to thank our technical team, which helped everything run smoothly this evening, and all of our transition partners for making this whole series possible. You can find out more information on the whole project at fwi.co.uk forward slash transition. If you have a minute now, then please answer the feedback questionnaire, which should be appearing on your screen. This is a learning curve for us too, and we'd love to know how we can do the best job possible. Lastly, and most of all, a huge thank you to all of you who have joined us this evening. We really appreciate it. I wish you all a pleasant evening and see you all again for the next summit next month. Good night. <laughs>